Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lee Schwartz, and I'd like to welcome you to the second webinar in our series for vet practices. Today's topic is tax advantage retirement planning options for veterinary practices. So I notice a lot of familiar names on the attendee list. I know many of you attended our last webinar last month, and we're excited to continue bringing you this really important information. So we'll jump in here in just a sec, but a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you have a question during the webinar, open up the chat box in Zoom and submit your question to all panelists. We are gonna to try to leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Also, we're recording this webinar today. You'll receive an email with a link to a survey as well as our SVA resource page where the recording will be available. Now, many of you are already clients of SVA and we'd encourage you to reach out to your SVA contact if you have questions coming out of this. I'd also encourage you to share our contact details with other business contacts who could use our help. You know, over the last year and a half, we've really seen a lot of practices out there that are not getting timely or knowledgeable advice from their CPAs or their advisors, and we're obviously happy to step in and help. Now, if you're not a client and you have questions, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to get you connected to a subject matter expert at SVA who can help. So we wanted to cover retirement planning today because many of our clients are earning more than ever now. And the only thing holding them back from more growth is recruiting and retaining good employees. So this, top, this topic obviously hits on both. And if you attended our first webinar in the series, you're already familiar with our presenters, Andy Slinger and Nate Drykosen. But for you first timers, Andy is a principal and Nate is a manager in our healthcare and veterinary practice. Now, both Andy and Nate help lead the team that works with veterinarians around Wisconsin and really all around the Midwest to help them minimize taxes and maximize profitability. So I'll be back towards the end for some Q&A, but Andy, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thanks, Lee. Uh, as he said, we are very, very excited to have all of you join us for the second webinar of our series. So before we get started, uh, we, we like to do a quick poll to get a pulse of, of everyone in the room. So, very simple question, yes or no, do you currently have a retirement plan in place? Results coming, all right. So we have a one third of you have a plan in place and I'm excited that, that two thirds don't. So regardless of your answer, this is going to apply to you because if, if you don't have a plan in place, one of the goals of today is to encourage you to consider putting one in for some of the reasons that, that Lee introduced that I'll, I'll expand on. And on the other hand, if you already have a plan in place, that's okay too, because we also want to encourage you to consider, is it the best option for you right now? Okay. So on that note, what's our goal today overall? First and foremost, you know, why is this important right now? Why, why are you taking the time to, to look at this? Why are we talking to all of our clients about this right now, between now and the end of the year? Number two, we want to give you some high-level considerations in order to help you select the right plan. It, it is not a one-size-fits-all. There are so many moving pieces. You could have the exact same plan, but for two very similar practices, it could have very different results. So it's very important to understand some of the basic differences. Number three, at a high level, Nate's going to take you into some of the common plan types that we see and the key features of that. And as we'll introduce, while it'll be very important that you keep us involved in the process and, or, or your current advisor in the process, you're also going to need to involve what we call a third-party administrator or a TPA. And you'll work with that TPA to really look at your options and guide you through that process of either putting in a retirement plan or modifying and, and taking it to a, to a different level. And then at the end, you're probably going to be in one of two camps. You're either going to be like, you know what, I'm good. I'm good right where I'm at based on what I've heard. Or you may be like, all right, I'm accepting the call to action. I'm ready to do something. What do I do and how do I do it? And so we'll address that at the end. Okay, so my call to action, why is this important right now? You know, why have I encouraged our clients to make this a high priority in 2021 and into 2022? For example, just had a discovery call with, with a prospect on Monday, a veterinarian that, that really wants to work with us. 
And she was humble. She said, I don't want to brag, but I've never had so much cash in my practice. I've never been so profitable. And quite frankly, I just don't know what to do. I need help. Well, you can guess if we end up working with her, what one of the high priorities is going to be that we're going to talk to her about. But related to that, all the growth, all the profitability, all the cash that she has, guess what? She's also going to pay more tax than she's ever paid, you know, related to that practice. And a lot of you, many of you, most of you are in that same boat. And if, if you're not working closely with your advisor right now, there, there's going to be a tax surprise coming when you file your taxes in 2021. So the beauty of putting in a retirement plan, if it works for you, if, you, if we can find the right one that works for you, number one, you're going to pay less tax. And I've yet to find anybody who doesn't get excited about that. Number two, as Lee introduced, preaching to the choir, we're all having a hard time retaining and attracting the best and the brightest in our industries, okay? And, and you're feeling that right now. And if you, if you find the right plan, you're hopefully just adding a layer of benefit to your staff and potential staff that hopefully you know, makes them more loyal uh, in, in your practice and, and puts you maybe at a, at a competitive advantage compared to other options they may have in your area. And again, as we'll introduce, the concept is you're paying less tax to the IRS, less tax to your state government, wherever you are. But in turn, you're, you're giving some of that to your staff. You're putting more of, way, more of it away in your retirement plan and, and maybe even have some left over for, for, for personal cash flow. So it's a win-win there. And then lastly, more than any other year, probably my career, I'm getting calls from veterinarians that for various reasons say, I'm ready to work less or I'm ready to retire in X number of years, or you know what, I'm ready to consider selling my practice, okay, for whatever reason. And, and no matter which of those you're in, or, or even if you're gonna work for 20 more years, the sooner you put in a retirement plan, the sooner you start putting as much money away as you can, and it hopefully grows and compounds, guess what? The sooner you can get to that point where you can work less, you can retire, you can sell your practice. So the earlier you start, the better. So again, check, check, check. Everybody loves um, the result of, of those three. And that's why it's, it's, it's important. Okay. So there's my call to action. So now what do I consider? You know, what do I consider as far as finding the right plan? It, it, it is not a one size fits all. I really want to stress that today. So this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but number one, as you consider the different plans you can put in place, you have to consider the different levels of funding that come with that plan, okay? All of you are in a different situation, all right? Some of you maybe just acquired a practice, all right? And some real estate that goes with the practice. So you may be in a position where when you have excess cash, you wanna pay down some debt because that's very important to you. So that may be the case. Maybe you don't have as much cash flow you know, as, 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 as some practices do. Maybe you have other personal goals where you're, you're using that cash and you don't wanna necessarily put it into a retirement plan right now. Maybe that's three, five years down the road. That's okay. It may not be the right time, but if you get the introduction to it now, maybe when you're in that right place, you at least know, okay, it's time to revisit this. It's time to move. So you gotta consider the funding costs and is it the right time for you? Related to that, you want a plan that's flexible, like an accordion. In a high profit year like 2021, you want to be able to have the flexibility to put in a big contribution. But typically, you may not know that till later in the year. Same thing in a low year. Maybe you have a, an associate leave you and you have a hard time replacing that associate. You might have to condense the practice a little bit, maybe a lower profit year. You want the flexibility to put in a lower contribution. So again, you want that flexibility. The second one's huge, all right? Compensation. Some veterinarians, for various reasons, like to keep their salary, W-2 salary, low relative to their production, okay? What we found in doing these analyses with our clients is that a lot of times, in order to maximize the benefit of the retirement plan you're moving to, you may need to be willing to increase your W-2 salary, okay? And so we can talk about the pros and cons, but you got to be ready for that potential. Secondly, age is huge. OK, and, and really specifically, I know we hate to talk about age, but it's a fact. The age of the owners versus the age of the staff. 
and the age of the highly compensated employees, which typically are the owners, again, compared to the staff. So age is a big factor. And think about what's happened in the last three to five years, especially. A lot of practices have changed hands. And in most cases, let's face it, they've gone from an older seller to a younger buyer. Okay. And so if you still have the same plan in place that the seller had, because of the sudden change in ages relative to your staff, it may not be the best plan for you. So it's just another reason to look at it and consider that you may need a different plan design. Okay. Um, third one we've really already kind of talked about as far as the owner's personal needs. Again, it, you may not have the cash. At the same time, let's face it, not all of us are really good at saving money. In fact, some of us are really bad at saving money. And what I hear a lot from our clients down the road is, you know, I really love the fact that I had a retirement plan early because I'm not a good saver, but it forced me to save and it forced me to save early and it grew and it compounded. And before you knew it, I, I was able to be in a place where I could retire at the lifestyle I wanted. So again, you got to know yourself. If you're not a good saver by nature, the retirement plan, that's just another added layer of benefit for you. Last but not least, you'll have to consider the resources to administer the plan. A lot of you double as the bookkeeper and as the HR person in your practice. And so you have to consider what burden am I taking on? What, what's going to fall on you or my office manager? What can I outsource to my, my third party administrator? And then also the related costs involved, depending on who does what. Okay. So that takes us right to our next poll question before I turn it over to Nate. So if you already have a plan in place, have you had it uh, evaluated in the last two years? And I guess if you don't have a plan in place, then it's, then it's NA, but have you had it evaluated in the last two years? Results coming in. Whoa, okay. So this one's unanimous. Either you don't have a plan or you haven't had it reviewed. So you're in the perfect place. So on that note, Nate, for all the people participating, um, can you please give us a high level overview of, of some options that uh, all of our attendees can consider? Thanks, Andy. Uh, absolutely. Well, this list is not meant to be exhaustive. Um, some of the common ones that we typically see are simple IRAs, 401k plan, 401k with profit sharing, and then also cash balance plan or a defined benefit plan. I'm guessing that most of you have probably heard of the, the first and second one, but the cash balance plan might be something that's a little bit, a little bit newer out there um, that, that hasn't historically really been available or, or used by veterinarians just because of what it requires, but it's something we're, that we've seen more and more discussion about. So first we'll kind of jump in at a high level at simple IRAs. All right, so a couple of the key features here is that with a simple IRA, you can defer a maximum amount of $13,500 from your wages, uh, just like you would for a 401k um, or any other type of retirement plan. And those can be done at either a pre-tax or post-tax basis. And if you happen to be over 50, you can also defer a $3,000 catch-up as part of the simple IRA. Now, a simple IRA plan does also, on the employer side of things, require a match of a certain percent up to a certain per certain percent. So and a lot of times we see 100% of the first 3% deferred by everyone in the plan. That includes owners and employees or some sort of a profit sharing percentage, which is, is commonly at, I would say, 2 or 3%. And the profit sharing percentage is calculated based on the compensation of everyone in the plan rather than the amount that they defer. And we'll have a, a good example here in a second that, that's going to illustrate this. But that's the key takeaways from, from a simple IRA. The one, the couple items that are that are really nice about this option is that uh, with simple IRAs, the cost is very low and it's pretty easy to establish the plan. The actual amount required to be contributed from a, a clinic or an employer is generally pretty low. Um, again, since most of that is based on the, the, the 3% or a percentage of compensation, it, it tends to relate uh, and, and kind of scale in size with the practice. It also tends to have pretty easy administration costs and, and, and functions. With the simple IRA plan, 
there's not a form 5500 to be filed with the IRS every year. So that can be a huge cost savings. And there's really not any, uh, any kind of testing so that the plan can, can pass muster with the IRS. Uh, some of the cons are obviously, there's a lower contribution threshold as part of this plan, right? Your, your maximum contributions are a little bit lower than what's possible with 401ks and profit sharing. So it just kind of falls into place with how, how much these plans are scrutinized as well. Also, the contributions to employees are required. So that generally happens whether the employees actually choose to participate in the simple IRA plan or not. Um, so that would be, of course, fall into the 3% uh, or the 2%, as I mentioned earlier. One other great point with simple IRAs is that they are most often self-directed, meaning that each employee or participant in the plan has direction of how they'd like their funds invested. And there is no pooling of funds. Each, each person's fund remains a separate ledger, so to speak, of contributions and distributions. And that's kind of really what facilitates the, the less administration required with the plan. All right, so 401ks and profit sharing. As I mentioned earlier, touched on earlier, a little bit more of a robust plan. And, and with 401k profit sharing plans, there's a few layers to consider here. The first layer, we'll call it, is the deferrals. And the deferrals are made by each participant in the plan and it's deducted from their, their wages. Again, that can be at a, a either a post-tax or a pre-tax basis. The next layer is the actual employer matching of contributions. So there's a couple different approaches to this that, that we'll go over here in a second. Um, but at a broad level, there's discretionary or safe harbor formulas. And then the final layer is profit sharing. So with profit sharing, profit sharing is going to be a discretionary employer contribution that are gonna be used with formulas, which are often tied to different compensation or age requirements dynamics of the practice. At a broad level, some of the, the plan limits that would be in place for the current year for 401k plans, the maximum deferral amount is 19,500 with a post 50 year catch up of 6,500. And kind of the, the pie in the sky number that is helpful to remember, but can be difficult to attain is the maximum combined contribution per person. So this is going to be all 401k deferrals plus matching plus profit sharing. That limit is 58,000 or 64,500 after factoring in the over 50 catch up. The compensation limit that's going to be used in the calculations as far as how much you can you could potentially raise compensation to increase the total amount to put away would be 290,000 for this year. And the threshold to determine who would be considered a highly compensated employee for discrimination testing for this year is going to be 130,000. So that last point kind of touches on a little bit too, just something to keep in mind that since with this plan, you're able to potentially put away a little bit more, the IRS is a little bit more concerned about discriminating in favor of, of highly compensated owners and highly compensated employees. So there's some just different testing and procedures that go into to calculating the amount each year. Now, I would say that as veterinarians become more and more profitable, increasing compensation is something that they definitely consider as, as part of that as their practice grows and as they look to put more away in their retirement. And because they might be willing to look at increasing their compensation, that tends to give them a little bit more flexibility to jump to the 401k plan and, and it might make, make become a, a better plan for them based on where they are in, in the life cycle of, of their career. All right, so with that, we're gonna, we're gonna get to a little bit of an example to kind of illustrate how, how the 401k plan works. Uh, but first, we're going to spend a, just a minute on some of the terminology that we've covered so far and, and that you'll see in the coming slides. So first off is the safe harbor, and that factors in as part of the, the profit sharing calculation and, and also the match. So a shareholder, there's a couple different approaches to this, the first being the shareholder match formula and then also a non-elective contribution. With the matching formula, a great example of, of something we might see would be a matching of the employer of 100% of the first 3% deferred by all participants of a plan. So that's across owners and employees, and then say 50% on the next 2%. Again, this can really vary and can be set and tailored a little bit based on what you're looking to do with the plan. 
Another, another option is an employer 3% contribution, and that is non-elective. That's just a flat amount that gets contributed every year. And really what it boils down to is the preferences of what the owner might be looking for, and then also the value that you'd like to give to your employees. You know, based on your practice dynamics, one might be a better fit than another. Then a couple other items in, in terms of how this is actually applied. Pro rata means that everyone re receives the same percentage uh, of profit sharing. Um, that's typically a, the most simplistic option. Um, the integrated approach is typically allocated at a different percentage based on ages and then also earnings levels. So that approach to the plan tends to favor higher earning younger owners. So I like a lot of times what, when an ownership, there's a transition in ownership of a practice, something that would have possibly been either pro rata or cross-tested plan, like we're gonna go over here in a second, maybe it makes a little bit more sense to jump to the integrated approach. And the cross-tested plan is allocated based on employee grouping types. And this tends to very simply favor owners who are on average older than their staff. So again, this would be veterinarians and owners who would be later in their careers looking to retire um, sooner than later. There really is no one size fits all and it truly does depend on your practice demographics. So if you're considering moving to a profit cherry plan or even reevaluating your options, just getting a sense of demographics and, and kind of compiling all the information uh, in one location is going to be crucial to determine what might be the best fit for you. So moving on to our, our, our brief example here of, of employer contributions, we're going to make a few assumptions with this example. Uh, one, we, we decided to use nice round numbers for compensation. And two, we're assuming that both of the owners in this case are not going to be older than 50 years old. So there's going to be no catch up in place. So for owner one, owner two, we're assuming just a flat $100,000 compensation we're going to assume that they're deferring the maximum to their 401k plans, which is 19,500. To illustrate a 3% match at 100% of the first 3% deferred, right? So they're deferring well over 3% to their 401k plans. The clinic would then match $3,000 because uh, again, getting the maximum of 3%. And then also at the profit sharing level, you're looking at $3,000, again, 3% of, of compensation. At the employee level, you might have some employees that participate and some that don't. And that's really true of, of all plans, uh, be that simple or 401k. With employee one, you're looking at 50,000 in comp, deferring 3%, the clinic then matches 3% and 3% uh, comes from the, the profit sharing layer. With employee two, you're looking at uh, $30,000 in comp and employee three, you're looking at $50,000 in comp. For this illustration, we decided to not have those individuals participate, but still showing that from a profit sharing layer, those employees provided they are eligible for the plan would still receive the 3% profit sharing. So just a quick comparison then to what this would look like from the 401k level and illustrate how it's different from a simple IRA. Under, under both, we're assuming again, the 3% level and being at pro rata versus cross testing or integrated because that would definitely complicate things a little bit. Owner one, looking at the total amounts that they can put away under the 401k and versus the simple IRA, you're looking at a $9,000 difference for each. And really that is coming from maximizing the, the extra amount from the 401k deferral and then the match process as well. With employee one, you're looking at again, able to give your employees a little bit more benefit to those who participate in the plan, because uh, those that do not participate still get the same percentage of profit sharing under either plan. So all in all, all in, um, looking at moving down the, the slide to the employer cost of 17,400 for the 401k, and then also the 9,900 for the simple IRA. Included in those numbers is simply the match in the profit sharing amounts and that is combined of the amount that's going to owners and then also the amount that's going to employees. So under the 401k option, the amount that's actually going to the owners is $12,000 of that cost. So that leaves about $5,400 of the, for the employees. Of the simple IRA, because uh, you have so a greater percentage of the owners participating, 
about $6,000 of that total cost is actually going to the owners. So a greater percentage goes to the owners of the total dollar amount, but not necessarily the same level of funding. So the 401k option gives the owners an additional way to put away a little bit more money. It does come at a little bit higher cost, but again, much of that cost is actually going to the owners themselves. And the results of the plan, looking at the owner tax savings, using a, an assumption of a nice round rate combined between federal and state income taxes, because in most practices, that income is flowing through to the, the owners, the veterinarian owners. The benefit is calculated based on the additional uh, amount that can be deferred with the 401k, so 19.5 versus the 13.5. Um, and then also this, assum this assumption is that everybody is doing these deferrals at a, at a traditional model. So that means pre-tax. And with that, you can notice a, a, a little bit substantial tax savings between the two models. Um, so again, that's coming from the 401k deferral, the employer match, the profit sharing contribution to get to that times the tax rate to get to that total. Uh, so with the 401k plan just gives you a little bit more latitude to manage your, your taxable earnings. So the kind of the, the final aspect of, of retirement options that is worth discussing, but we'll kind of keep it at a very high level as a cash balance plan. And cash balances are defined benefit plans. Um, so typically this is an add-on to the 401k profit sharing plan. And really this allows an additional deferment option to be able to put more away into the retirement. Uh, it, it provides funding for a future benefit at a certain age is, is, is how the actuarial analysis works. And when you do the cash balance plan option, all of the funds are going to be in a pooled account. So this option does tend to have a little bit higher administrative costs because since everything is one single pooled amount, somebody has to actually keep track of everybody's individual accounts and where contributions and distributions are being posted to track over time. Broad, broadly with cash balance plans, this is a really powerful tool that can be used to put even more away for, for retirement. And it is also a cash deductible expense to the practice. But maybe the one big downside to this is that with a defined benefit plan, the clinic does become responsible for any under, underfunding that occurs. So say you're making contributions for the employees and the market takes a little bit of a dive and now there's, there's a shortfall for the plan. Well, the clinic would actually be responsible for making up that shortfall to the employees. So to kind of cap all of this off, I do have a really good example of, of this whole movement from a simple IRA to a 401k plan um, to allow owners to, to defer a little bit more and put more away in their retirement plan. So I actually had a client that uh, was a very well-established practice, profitable, um, and, and she's within five years of retirement. And really, she just had some life events happen that, that really kind of messed up her retirement savings plan. So to kind of help remedy that situation, she was aware that you know in retirement, she's, she's probably gonna be in a lower tax bracket. So she's doing traditional 401ks, 401k contributions. She looked at increasing her compensation because again, she's a profitable clinic and, and has a little bit of wiggle room there. So after increasing her compensation, deferring the maximum for the 401k plan, she played with some of the testing and moved to a cross-tested model. And with those changes, she was able to defer the 19,500 maximum for 401k plus the over 50 catch-up of 6,500. And then also defer almost the maximum for profit sharing to get her a total of $63,000 she was able to put away for 2020 into her retirement plan, which was a tremendous relief for her and a tremendous benefit to help her accomplish her goals. So with that, I am going to actually pass it back to Andy for a few additional comments and then um, kind of what to do next. Thanks, Nate. A lot of information there. I want to be respectful of your time, but as I said at the beginning, right now you're probably thinking, all right, I know I need to do something. So what do I do? First thing, you know, we gave you a very high level overview, but I think, you know, you got to continue the conversation and you really have to determine which type of plan might be best for you based on the facts of and demographics in your practice. As I said, you got to work with a third party administrator, you know, and, and we can make an introduction. Um, you can go to your financial advisor, 
you know, and, and uh, you know, get an introduction there. You can go to your current advisor of any type, but you should be able to get an intro introduction to someone to get the process started. What that third party administrator is going to need once you say, yeah, I need to review my plan is if you already have a plan, they'll obviously need a copy of the plan document and, and, and what you're funding. Then they'll need what they call an employee census, which basically has names of your staff and owners, dates of birth, because age is important, date of hire, because there's eligibility requirements you can put in based on their tenure and their salary, you know, because again, we got to see the higher compensated versus the lesser compensated people. And then they can put together a summary of those options. And, and my, what I stress is once you have those options, make sure you involve us in the process all through this conversation, because we can help you evaluate those options and determine what it really means to you from a cash flow perspective, what it means from what's going to the owners versus what's going to the staff, what the tax savings is of the various options, and then the tangible and intangible pros and cons. We see these all the time, so we know that other than what's written on that piece of paper and, and what the tax savings is and who's going what, what else you can expect, you know, based on what plan you select. And then last but not least, you know, you got to consider timing and you got to provide proper notification and, and your, your third party administrator can help you with that. And, and I can't stress enough the employee education piece. Your, your employees will find the most benefit if they really understand the benefit and, and, and how it, it helps them, you know, both now and in the future. So please don't forget that employee education piece once you put that plan in place. Okay, last but not least, one final poll question for you. So after hearing this presentation, do you either intend to implement a new retirement plan in the next year or at the very least consider you know, another option, yes or no? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, I, I'm really excited that, that this is leading you to a, a call to action. Um, please, you know, call or email me or Nate anytime. Uh, if I don't see you before, I'll see you in a couple of weeks for our third webinar series. Thank you. And, and with that, I'll pass it back to Lee to uh, wrap things up for us. Thank you, Andy. And I guess you answered pretty much everybody's questions considering you got them from, what was it, a third? who had it in uh, in place to now everybody's gonna do it. So that's, uh, you guys covered a lot of ground. So thank you both. I know we were planning on leaving some time for Q and A. We did have a couple of questions come in. They're very specific and we'll reach out to you directly to uh, get those questions answered. But just to be respectful of everybody's time, we're gonna wrap up here. I just wanna remind you all that the SVA team is only a phone call or an email away. So if you're a client, reach out to your SVA contact. And if you're not, please feel free to reach out to me and we'll get your answers to those questions. So I just wanna let you know also, uh, you can visit svaaccountants.com slash vet, where we have e-guides and past webinars and upcoming events. Our next vet webinar will be on November 3rd, and the topic will be year-end tax planning 2021, what's new and what you need to plan for. So thanks again for uh, attending here today. Uh, hopefully we get to see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you at the, that next webinar on November 3rd. Bye-bye.